I'm Peter Block in Orlando, Florida, here at the ACC annual meeting, and we're here for On the Scene. To my far left is Tony DeMaria, an old friend, and to my immediate left is Deepak Bhatt from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, one of my own hometown kind of places. Welcome, folks. And we're here talking about the major trials that happened today. And there is one trial that probably is going to be the big hitter at this entire meeting, and that's Odyssey. So, Tony, I'm going to let you start because we've had a discussion about this trial. and We have some significant different interpretations about it, or at least take homes. Tony, go ahead, give your uh, speech here. Sure. So uh, the trial was testing the ability of additional LDL lowering with a PCSK9 above and beyond statins to reduce heart events, major adverse cardiac events. And it was a four-year follow-up. Indeed, the PCSK9 did reduce LDL. It was a treat-to-target study. And there was a small but statistically significant reduction in major adverse cardiac events. So let me cut in because this is acute coronary syndrome patients, a right? A acute coronary syndrome patients, exactly, treat to target uh, uh, a 25 to 50 LDL with a one and a half, two percent reduction in, in major events. Uh, in 18,000 patients. Okay, so that's the trial. Go ahead, Deepak, you get a chance to give your side of it and then we'll talk about it. Okay, good. And I should disclose that I did serve, I do serve on the Odyssey Executive Committee meeting. Uh, and Does that mean you're biased? Uh, I don't think so, but uh, we'll see what you think. Uh, I only saw the results as did the whole Executive Committee about a week ago, so it's still pretty fresh. Uh, in our minds. Uh, but uh, as uh, Tony said, this is patients 1 to 12 months post ACS, treat to target the first trial that does it, shooting for an LDL between 25 and 50. So there was some uh, potential down titration of drug. But regardless, a positive trial, 15% relative risk reduction in MACE. But what I thought really moves the field forward was that the all cause mortality was also lower in the overall trial. And if you go beyond that aspect and look at a subgroup of those with an LDL cholesterol greater than or equal to 100, a biologically plausible subgroup, there the reductions in MACE and all-cause mortality were much larger. In, in absolute terms, absolute risk reductions of over 3% in MACE, 1.7% uh, in mortality. So at that point, you know, I think those are clinically worthwhile reductions in a population that'd be pretty easy to identify. Had your ACS, your LDL is above 100 despite being on a high potency statin or a maximally tolerated statin, go ahead and treat to target. Well, uh, let me ask you a question though. If you were presenting this as the uh, PI, I would say, now wait a minute, just above 100, we can, get, we can do that with statins. And why not just push statins as far as you can? It seems to me there's relative- I think you should, if you okay. can. But there's relatively, less than I would have thought reduction in mortality in patients whose LDL is between 50 and 100. Would you agree with that? It's, there's something funny going on here. Well, I don't think there's anything funny. I think, first of all, those patients whose LDL is on the lower range of that spectrum have lower event rates. They're, they're lower risk patients. And uh, there, to see any sort of robust benefit in MACE and mortality, I think would have required even more patients and longer term follow-up. But here, this trial has validated that this approach, PCSK9 inhibition, when we're targeting a pretty low LDL in that 25 to 50 range, can safely reduce MACE and mortality. So it's MI that's reduced, it's ischemic stroke that's reduced, and it's all-cause mortality that's lower. So to me, if a drug is able to do that without any major side effects other than injection site reactions, no other imbalance in anything we detected, other than the cost issue, then I'm not going to trivialize why wouldn't you say put me on it if you're a post-ACS patient. Okay, Tony, beat up on him a little bit. <laughs> well, no, I, th I think if you focus on absolute reduction, then it's relatively small. That may be a problem of the fact that we do so well in these post-ACS patients, really our, our target for doing better and better and better is, is difficult. It, it involves injections and nobody likes that and, and they're what, just under 10% uh, 
of, of the uh, population, as I recall, did drop out of, of the study. So that uh, if, if you factor in the cost and the injections and the absolute benefit, if I got my LDL down to 50 with statins, You'd be a happy I'm honestly camper. not yeah. sure that I'd, I'd take the additional PCSK9. But if you saw the last slide that Dr. Stegg showed, the clinical implications, and that was something the executive committee really thought a lot about, we're not saying to use it in that person. We're saying consider it in that patient who despite maximally tolerated statin, their LDL is still greater than 100. So in that patient who's a post-ACS patient, there I think their absolute risk reductions get to be really quite respectable. So I totally agree with the point you made. If you can do it on high potency generic statins, throw some azetamibe in there for good measure and the LDL is below 100, I'm not sure I would say spend the money. Uh, it, it, because it comes down to a cost issue. But I think if your LDL is still above 100 despite the doctor's best efforts and the patient's best efforts, and that post-ACS patient seems like a reasonable thing to do. Okay. It's kind, kind of what I, yeah. I tried to say. My LDL got down to 50. Yeah, you know, I think we'd all probably use it if her LDLs were high, right? And yeah, what's, what's intriguing is what would have happened if they brought the LDL down below 25? because uh, uh, there they might have seen uh, a really significant effect in those patients whose baseline LDL was at a, uh, lower than 100. But uh, I think that would have happened, but a counter critic will say, well, maybe the side effects would have then not been Could have been. Placebo. Could so, have been. Hard to say. The conversation, of course, doesn't reflect any kind of disagreements we have here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move on because there are other trials. The VEST trial. The best trial is the ICD versus uh, a um, wearable defibrillator uh, post-MI. Uh, you know a lot about this trial, Deepak. Give me a short version. Well, you, you explained it pretty well. Uh, there's uh, older data that pretty consistently shows that putting an ICD early in those types of patients, post-MI, low EF, for whatever reason, actually doesn't reduce events, some signals of harm even. Uh, you can come up with explanations. I'm not 100% sure uh, really why that happens, but regardless, uh, the guidelines, the reimbursement, you, you can't just throw an ICD in, in these folks for secondary prevention uh, right after their MI. Hence, there is a potential value of a wearable cardioverter uh, defibrillator. That was tested now in a randomized couple of thousand patient trial, well done study, and uh, you know, for the primary endpoint, uh, it wasn't significant, but for all-cause mortality, it was. So, to me, again, you know, mortality trumps everything. You guys are a couple of skeptics that are surrounding me here. <laughs> I, I know Tony's just ready We're to, pounce. to pounce. Uh, he is. I, I can sense it. Uh, I, I feel like I'm in the savannah. <laughs> you guys are ready. But, you know, it's a reduction in all-cause mortality. It's a safe thing. Again, putting cost issues aside, if I had a big MI, I'd rather go home with the vest than not. Tony? So I, I don't I don't disagree honestly I, I I was amused by the premise that because an ICD didn't work that a, a, a device that essentially treated exactly the same condition would and and in fact it didn't sudden death was not changed but overall mortality was and in my experience there's a, a psychological benefit I, I, I've seen in patients where I've used the vest and they go home and and they just feel a, a little bit better a little bit safer and in fact they're getting a benefit in overall reduction uh, even though we may not be sure exactly why so uh, I, I, I don't disagree with you all although I think in terms of, of the mechanistic premise, uh, it's, it's a little bit uncertain at it the moment. It is interesting that sudden death has not changed between the two groups. And it, but I think what happens is if people wear a vest and they have this device on, they have a sense that if something funny is happening, they'll go to their doctor more quickly. Maybe they'll pick up an SVT or pick up early heart failure or something which will actually affect mortality, or a TIA rather than a stroke. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, really, you need a sham control to sort out those subtle issues. And I might have called for one, but you know, here where there's a reduction in all-cause mortality, again, I tend to give the benefit of the doubt to the device or the drug, you know? We don't like patients that die. I mean, that's absolutely. our job. Okay, uh, let me make one comment about the notion trial, which uh, since Could I'm a I j just quickly go back one sure. thing that we should point out was that the average use was about 14 hours a day. 
So it's conceivable had had that use been, let's say, 20, 24 hours, they might have been a little bit better. Can you sleep with this thing on? Not very well. Some patients can. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can't shower with it on, but otherwise, yeah. if, if you do, what, the more you wear it, the more potential yeah. benefit. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Notion trial. <clears throat> it's the Nordic trial about tavern, since I'm a tavern kind of person. Uh, let me make a quick comment. It seems to me that uh, th they essentially took patients with STS scores less than four. These are really the lowest STS score patients. Followed them now out for four years, I believe, or five years, five, sorry. Five. five years, and it turns out that TAVR versus SAVR, surgical aortic valve replacement, uh, there is no difference in outcome between the two, except there is more paravalvular leak, and patients with TAVR have more AR, and number two, this issue of pacemaker need is greater in the TAVR patients. And interestingly, in this notion trial, the TAVR patients that had a pacer had worse mortality. So there's something bad that goes on if you need a pacer and your conduction tissue is embarrassed. So um, an interesting trial, it gets down to the low STS scores, but it gets us to the conversation of when do we actually say no to TAVR and yes to surgical aortic valve replacement in very, very low risk patients. I don't think we really know the answer to that yet, but candidly, if I were 55 years old and had an SDS score of two, I'm not sure I'd want to, I'd want to have a tavern and have a really good surgeon fix oh, my I agree with you. I'd want more long-term durability data if I were low yeah. surgical risk and young. I think I'd still stick with surgery for the time being. Yeah, Tony, what I, do you think? I think maybe in 10 years or 15 years that uh, we'll do only TAVR, but for the moment, uh, if I'm young and, and low risk, I had such a patient just last week, I recommend surgical intervention. It's still a little bit of a question that we don't know the answers to, and, and conservative therapy is probably appropriate. Okay, well that's a long, somewhat longer than we thought wrap up, but nonetheless, wrap up of day one. Thank you folks. <laughs>